Good afternoon. Let's uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased to welcome Dr. Mark Kay uh, as our uh, Friday seminar speaker today. Uh, Mark did his PE, uh, his undergraduate uh, in zoology and philosophy at the University of Kentucky. He then did a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from UC Irvine. Uh, he was a pre-doctoral fellow down at Stry uh, and then was a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian National uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, he was a faculty member at UNC Chapel Hill, working out at their uh, Moorhead City Marine Lab from 1982 to 1999. And then in 99, he moved to Georgia Tech, taking an endowed position as the Teasley Chair. Um, I looked Mark up this morning on Google Scholar, where his H index is a mere 96, uh, with over 30,000 citations. So he's been quite productive and has achieved a number of awards. Uh, I'm not going to list all of them here, but he's uh, a member of the um, AAAS. He's an ESA uh, fellow. Uh, and most recently was inducted into the National Academy of Sciences. So he's had a remarkable career. Um, the secret to Mark's success, though, is that he works even when he's sleeping. And I know this because my very first semester in graduate school, we had a seminar from 8 to 10 in the morning on Wednesdays. And your whole grade is basically giving this seminar, right? So I'm 10 minutes into my seminar on about my floor slide, and I look back, and Mark is asleep. <laughs> And I'm thinking to myself, this isn't going very well. So I decide to, to soldier on. And uh, suddenly Mark bolts awake, asks me by orders of magnitude the hardest, most insightful question of anyone in the room. I can't answer it and fumble around. He explains to me why I'm wrong. I take a minute to collect myself. I turn back around, change the slide, I turn back around, and he's asleep again. <laughs> So Mark, I don't know if I'm still as boring as I was then. I've sure have tried to improve in the meantime, but come on up here. Let's welcome Mark, everybody. Okay, okay thanks, Lee. Um, there are a number of stories like that. I think I hallucinate. I'm just resting my eyes. I'm not really yeah. sleepy. Um, okay, what I wanna talk to you about today, you, usually I do plant herbivore things and I'll have a little, introduction here to convince you that I'm still working on plant herbivores, even though there's none of it in this talk. Um, but I wanna talk about some things that we may have started and, and caused great changes in 100, 200 years ago that we're reaping the negative benefits of now and, and didn't realize that. And I'll, I'll give you an example, but I'll give you some background first. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna to try to convince you that the animal corals are really like plants, and they are because they're photosynthetic, that microbes are just small consumers that uh, eat up things, and that detritivores are um, really kind of predators of these microbes. And so think of them as the, the Roombas of the reef that are no longer there. If, if I hope everybody knows what a Roomba is, but we have dogs in my house and these damn little under feet things run around constantly. Um, <clears throat> and so, how come this doesn't work? Okay, enough of that, let's do this. Um, okay, so here's the Caribbean of sort of the 1970s up in the left-hand part when I started working there and um, in the, late 90s when I left the Caribbean, it was sort of slime. And we had lost most of the corals and we'd gone from around 50 or 60% coral cover down to about 10, okay? And it's, it has stayed there largely. Um, and a lot of that has been due to disease. And, and it's not just the Caribbean, this is the Indo-Pacific and some work from John Bruno and his, his group. And so between, um, the 1980s and the early 2000s, you lost about half of the corals. This is Pacific wide, but if you look at the Philippines or mainland Asia uh, or the Great Barrier Reef, they all show the same sort of story. You're going from 40 or 50% cover down to about 20% cover. And then in 15, 16, you lost half of all that in, in one year mm -hmm. along the Great Barrier Reef. And so <clears throat> um, there's a lot of things contributing to that. Um, there's been discussions, let's call them, about whether that's overfishing or um, pollution 
or global warming. And I want to say, yeah, that's what it is. It's all those things. Uh, and they're interacting potentially. But I want to sort of switch and say, what can we do about it rather than just cataloging the demise? And so we've been sort of trying to look at small tweaks that you could do to reefs that might make them more resilient versus big efforts which don't work very well. Um, we know that if you remove predators, upper level predators from various systems, and, and one of the sort of um, models for this is Jim Estes' works on killer whales and, and uh, sea otters. And so if you have sea otters, they're eating the herbivores and you've got a lot of kelp. If the killer whales eat the sea otters, they're not eating the urchins and you have very little kelp, uh, much more herbivory, et cetera. And there's Jim sort of, he used to send me pictures periodically of the big fish that he would catch when he was by himself and the little ones we would catch when we were together. I could never, <laughs> could never quite figure out uh, where he bought these fish to take the pictures of. Um, but again, and this is from Jim as well, this is sort of um, year zero up in Alaska um, with the sea otters absent and uh, three years later when the sea otters were reintroduced. So it makes a, a big, we know that those kind of things make a big difference. Um, we know that for freshwater systems as well. If you've got the three trophic le level system, um, you know, the fish are suppressing the, the grazers and you get lots of plankton and you get these either clear lakes or uh, turbid lakes, depending on whether the predators are or not. Okay, so kelp beds, it does it, lakes, it does it. Um, there's the Yellowstone system with Bill Ripple's work. Um, and so for reefs, we know that for herbivores at some level, in other words, um, you know, there's a similar appreciation for the lack of herbivory in these systems. We overfished <clears throat> those reefs. You had parrotfish and surgeonfish in the Caribbean in, in vast numbers early on. Um, these parrotfish, so-called because of this sort of fused beak, can kind of bite down into the substrate and um, remove not only the upright algae, but actually even endolithic algae that are growing down into the dead coral. They can grind that up, poop it out the back, and they make about half of the sand in the tropics through doing that. And if you remove them, if you cage them out, this is some work Sarah Lewis did in, in Belize, again, back in the 80s. Within 10 weeks, you had these brown algal beds that overgrew and killed the corals. If you took those fences down in 24 to 48 hours, all that 10 weeks of accumulated biomass disappeared. Okay, so herbivory was a big deal. We knew about that. Now, I had always wondered, I, I had seen accounts of in the late 17, early 1800s, um, ships, sailing ships coming out of North Australia, uh, Papua New Guinea, these areas with hundreds of tons of dried sea cucumbers. And if you're diving in modern oceans, you can't imagine getting a ton of sea cucumbers because you see one every now and then much less hundreds of tons of dried. And dried sea cucumbers are, depending on the species, maybe four to 10% of the wet mass. And so 100 tons is a lot of dried sea cucumbers. <clears throat> and those are, were collected and sold in the um, Asian market. And they're kind of like these Roombas. They're kind of running around the reef sucking muck, okay? And, um, Really in COVID, we learned about essential workers and how important this was for us. And it may be that we removed a lot of the essential workers from coral reefs 200 years ago or 100 years. Today, we're still collecting 200 million of these a year are sold in the Asian market. And um, I don't know where you get them even. And if you, if you collect these, it's not a fishery, it's a mining process. In other words, these guys are laying out on the sediment. If they're at high density, they're external fertilizers, they're throwing eggs and sperm up in the water column. And if there's many per square meter, 
those all get together or enough of them get together. If there's one on this side of the road and one on that side of the road and the probability of sperm and egg meeting is really quite low. And so in some areas that were collected 60 years ago, there's been no recovery. Okay, so it either takes decades or centuries or it just doesn't happen. It's kind of like coal, you remove it, it's gone, okay? And so um, we had uh, wanted to know for quite some time, what were they doing? And is it important that you're removing these detritus? Well, we know wolves are important, they're cool too. These guys are muck suckers, what, they're not that cool, right? So, um, you know, we know all these big guys are important. We know these guys have been removed. This is, is just a, um, you know, sort of the fisheries harvest of these um, over recent years. And in some areas, like in French Polynesia, where we're working now, when they opened the fishery in about three years, it went from abundant to you could hardly find any. Okay. <clears throat> we finally found an area that had a, quite a few sea cucumbers in it of one species that is low quality for collection, enough so that we could do an experiment and say, what are they doing and what importance might it have? And so um, this is uh, Morea in French Polynesia. Um, the reefs there are pretty good. They're not great. The above water vision when you come up from diving is spectacular. And um, most of what I'll tell you about is from an area right over in here. Um, and if I can get this to run. Okay, so um, this is like all these black dots down here that you see are sea cucumbers. Okay, so in, in this area, there's about seven per square meter. And there's a few bays there like this. If we go off to one of the remote islands in the Tetiaroa, it's like this as well. Um, we can find old literature from Anawitak and some of these really remote areas that list this species as 50 per square meter in the 1950s and 60s. I can't imagine that that's normal. That almost has to be somewhere where there's a lot of input of some sort and an unusual buildup. But it's not inconceivable at all that um, these things were at, at high abundance. Um, <clears throat> okay, you've seen that already. Um, and what they do is feed around the mouth there and eventually stuff comes out the back. Okay, so these are just detritivore sucking up gorp, okay? But what they're doing is turning that gorpy organic stuff into, into sea cucumber biomass where you're containing those nutrients and that organic material. So think about it as soil in a way. And rather than all the dirt being out here, a lot of it's being made into biomass that's more controllable. Um, and if you look at, at the site where we're working on this and you do the calculations, you're talking about 600 kilograms, 1,500 pounds, 1,300, something like that per meter square per year of sediment is going through these guys. Okay. And so that's a lot of cleanup. It's also a lot of you're eating sand with just a little bit of organic material in it. And you're processing that constantly. Okay. Um, now, Cody Clements is uh, one of my postdoc at present. Let me actually, I'll turn that on in a second. Um, Cody worked out a way for another experiment. We were looking at, at coral diversity and we wanted to be able to outplant corals in a natural way that's easy and that we can screw them in, unscrew them, weigh them, get mass change over time, et cetera. So Cody worked out this ability to take Coca-Cola caps, which we get by the 8,000 pounds at a time, um, actually from the Coca-Cola bottling company, we can glue those caps upside down in here, cut the tops off of them, glue the coral in there, and we can screw it in and out. And this is, again, a, a 
different experiment, but just to show you sort of what some of this looks like. This is one of the diversity things from, and we've got I don't know, six of these kind of fields of artificial core, not artificial, real corals, but in artificial settings out there. And so um, Cody has transplanted thousands of these corals. And um, so some of these, whoops, let's go there again. Some of these are corals that grow on hard substrate. Some of them are ones that normally grow on soft substrates and make like thickets. Okay, so think of them as sort of um, tumbleweeds, okay, in the, in the desert. These guys are supposedly fragment during storms. Those fragments roll around, start new colonies, and you get a thicket of these that grows. First thing we did, this is one of the corals that grows on hard substrate most of the time, but that hard substrate are, are little patch reefs with lots of sand in between it. And so we planted some of these into cages with sea cucumbers at natural densities and into ones where we had caged out the sea cucumber. And this just shows sort of how we're transplanting some of those in. But these are a couple of centimeters above the sediment and that becomes important later on. Um, and then we just looked at the effect on the substrate and the effect on the ability of the corals extract to suppress coral pathogens. Because what, and I'll, I'll tell you what we see on some of these is we see a white band start here at the base and work its way up and kill the whole coral over time. Um, and so when we did that, here's what the sea cucumbers are doing in terms of sediment pigmentation, if we just look down on the surface of that. So they're, they're eating diatoms and bacteria and things off the surfaces. Um, here's what happened in terms of the coral mortality during this 19 day period, and nothing happened on this one, but remember it was a couple centimeters above this sediment. More interestingly, this is the suppression. If the sea cucumbers were not there, then the extract from those corals suppressed a known coral pathogen by about 25%. If they were there, it suppressed it by about 40%. It was about a 50% increase in the activity um, of the extract from these corals. So there's something going on with the sea cucumbers that makes the corals have a better ability to defend themselves against this known coral pathogen. Um, and <clears throat> but we also wanted to look at this for a different acropora, acropora pulchra, which grows on sediments normally. Okay, so it's sort of like acropora cervicornis in the Caribbean, if you've seen that. And we could go to this area, and I know this is kind of hard to see, but all the little red dots are ones where we just went in and pitched out all the sea cucumbers from a patch. And those patches were anywhere from, I think about four square meters to about 50 square meters, something like that. And we had 10 patches where we pitched them all out every couple of days, and we had 10 patches where we left them normal. And we transplanted corals into those patches, um, but, but more like in natural settings where supposedly these things roll around after a storm and, and you know, start new colonies. And this just shows uh, one of those corals where we've, we've planted it there. And this shows the tissue mortality that we see. So picking up a coral and, you know, on that one, we'd look at it and go, okay, it's about 50% dead, okay? Um, and so with sea cucumbers there, you know, over this, and I can't remember for sure how many days this were, but I think about four weeks, um, you know, we had about 10% mortality versus about 60% mortality if the sea cucumbers weren't there. And that's on the tissue. If instead of that, we look at the ones that went all the way dead, then in that, time, well, there you go, 45 days, um, we lost one out of 50 if the sea cucumbers were there and we lost, um, whatever that is, 40% if they weren't there. Okay, so 
a lot more tissue death, a lot more hole death. Um, and this is in Morea, um, French Polynesia, and it's with that coral and that sea cucumber. Now, later on, we got the opportunity to go to Palmyra because it could be that one sea cucumber does something that nobody else does. And we can't, that sea cucumber, if I count 5,000 of them in that area, there's one individual of one other species out of that 5,000. So it's, it's all that one thing, okay? Um, if we go to Palmyra, which is off in the middle of nowhere, and we do the same sort of thing, but we say contact with the sediment or not by, by burying these a bit differently, okay? <clears throat> then what happens is, again, if they're in contact with the sediment, if the sea cucumbers are there or not there, then there's a lot more death without the sea cucumbers and with. This is a different coral, a different sea cucumber, and you're a thousand miles from where we did the first one. Um, and you, without contact, if they're transplanted above, it happens a lot more slowly, but you still, you still get some of it, okay? Sea cucumbers make a difference. Um, so there's a two to 400% increase in tissue mortality due to contact with the sediment in some way. Um, and especially if the sea cucumbers are not there. Um, now, so is there, you know, something damaging pathogens in the sediment um, that's suppressed by sea cucumbers? However, there are large thickets of this in the places where we're doing this experiment and they're doing fine. Okay, so there's gotta be something else going on as well. Um, and this is just to show you um, what we think is going on and I'll show this in a second, but you can see these uh, damsel fishes up here. They come into these thickets, they kill off the base of the coral and they grow a turf on that, that they defend. Um, if when these are first getting started, if these damsels aren't around, the coral just gets eaten. There's other fish that come in and eat them. These damsels drive, drive them off. So I'd always thought of these damsels as parasites. There's this thicket of coral. They're killing the base of it. Once they do that, you start getting all sorts of boring uh, organisms that, that tunnel into that. And it just kind of crushes down on itself. And so I had always thought of these guys as sort of parasitic on the coral. They're using it to grow this algal garden. But in fact, they may be lifeguards in, in some way or, or bodyguards that are defending the coral from pathogens in the sediment and making a barrier there. And so, you know, are these guys parasites or are they bodyguards? And so to get at that, um, again, Cody, and this just shows you how we, we bury these things. Um, we had corals without turf at the base, corals with turf at the base, or corals with turf at the base, but we buried it enough so that it was in contact, so that live tissue was in contact with the sediment. And um, then either had these with or without sea cucumbers in these cages. And um, again, this just, shows you the layout of that. In other words, all this stuff is done in the field. We never do anything in the lab because it's more fun to be underwater <clears throat> there than it is in a dark room somewhere. Um, and when we did that, if we had zero sea cucumbers, if there's no turf or, or turf, but it's embedded, you get rapid death. If if you have turf at the base, for, you know, making a barrier between the sediment and the live coral, you get almost nothing, okay? They do fine. Um, same thing over here, if you have one or two sea cucumbers and we, we had a zero, one or two, and the one and two didn't make much difference, so we've just clumped those. Um, <clears throat> but again, here, you know, you get a significant effect of sediment contact you get a significant fact of the sea cucumbers alone. So the sea cucumbers help a lot. The sediment contact is a big deal. Something's down in the sediments 
that's coming up and starting this white band that eats its way up and kills these things, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, we've, we've done a lot of, and, and I got suckered into this, um, we've done a lot of microbiome work on these things, thinking we could figure out what's killing them, what's going on, who are the pathogens, et cetera. And what I expected to find is if we, you know, if we looked right at this band, I was expecting the black death of some sort there to be 60% of the microbes. Um, if we looked up at the healthy tissue at the top, I wasn't sure what to expect. On the healthy ones, I thought it might be one way and over here we might see a, something going on, but it's not dead yet. What we see is there's no difference if we look at the top part that looks healthy. There's, there's no microbiome difference at all. If we look down here, there's a big difference, um, but it doesn't really tell us much. In other words, there's, uh, it's not like something's here that's at high abundance that's not over there. Uh, the community shifts. But, you know, if we look at a live possum and a dead possum matched, you know, squished on the road out here, the microbiomes are different. And if we sort of just watch, you see vultures around it all the time. So vultures are clearly squishing things on the road, right? And so, in other words, the, the, the problem is with a lot of this stuff, we don't know what's a cause and what's an effect. We also don't know if some tiny, di in other words, we do have some species specific differences here, but it's like, it's not there at all versus it's 0.01% of what's there. That doesn't mean it's not important, but it also doesn't mean that it's not a vulture that just happens to be walking by. And so um, I'm at least, I was thrilled by this whole microbiome thing because I thought here's a whole nother level of cool stuff going on but I can't tell what's cause and what's effect, okay? And we're, we're still gonna flail at this some, but I'm gonna kind of leave us there, I think. Um, okay, so I wanna argue that there's one more factor in this. Um, we have overfished reefs. We've kind of converted fish biomass into algal biomass because these reefs worldwide are kind of overgrown by algae now. You get storms. And this is not the Sargasso Sea. This is off in the Pacific. You've, you've probably read these papers since 2011, I think. We've started getting a lot more sargasso in the Sargasso Sea off here. It's, it's coming into Florida. It's coming into Cuba. It's coming into Belize. It's huge masses of stuff floating in. It stinks up the beaches. It causes things to go anaerobic. It's got heavy metals in it. It's lots of bad stuff going on. That's not what's going on here. These pictures are from French Polynesia. It's stuff that's breaking off the reefs in the storm and washing in. And so there's a huge amount of organic input that wasn't there before. It was in fish biomass before, and they were eating this stuff. Remember when Sarah Lewis caged places in Belize and it went to brown algal beds? These are what happens then. Okay. And if we, uh, this must be my Chinese slide, sorry about that. Um, if we go into this area, and, um, and I do have them in the right order, it's just upside down. If we go close to shore, that's zone one, or one, whatever that is. Um, and if we come off, we're just further and further offshore there, okay? And these big algal floats, get stuck back in here. Once you sort of pass this passage out here, we almost never get accumulation there, okay? So, so the physics or something is, is pushing these things into that area. And that might be in part what's feeding a lot of these uh, sea cucumbers. But the sea cucumbers I'll show you are at higher density back here than they are out here. I'm, I'm building up a story that these things are feeding the microbes that are killing the corals and the sea cucumbers are a counter to that. So if, if we look at this and we look at uh, algal deposition in zone one close to shore or four further offshore, 
this is, we put sort of traps there. That's over a week or two, the amount of algae that accumulates on the bottom at that site. Okay, so in other words, a lot of trash inshore, less trash offshore. Um, if we look at the organics in the sediment, um, without having removed the sea cucumbers, there's no difference. Even though you're putting in a lot of organics near shore, there's no difference. Okay. If we remove the sea cucumbers, then 14 days later, there's a difference. Okay. Um, if we look at our control patches where we didn't remove them, it wasn't a temporal thing. You know, they're keeping it down. If we look at the sea cucumber density, it's high in here where there's lots of organic deposition and it's, it's low further off. And then if we transplant corals into those areas where we've removed the sea cucumbers, again, death is high inshore where there's a lot of input, it's much lower offshore. So this input is somehow causing bad things to happen to the corals. And that is relieved at some level if the sea cucumbers are there. Was this a no one? Um, now, you know, we wanted to know if there was some confounding factor in that. In other words, there's a lot of stuff that's different inshore, offshore. There's more dogs pooping onshore than dogs pooping offshore. There's more development in there. There's probably more sedimentation. There's a lot of stuff that could confound that. So if we go off to that area that I told you there wasn't seaweed deposition, if we go more seaward to the cleaner area, and we just put down um, some mesh and we either trap algae under it or don't, okay? And then we transplant corals into that after seven days and then we watch those for a few days. So we've got turbinaria, common brown algae that's in those floats, sargassum, a common brown algae that's in those floats, dictyota, a brown, but it makes different chemistry. And I thought this might be cool. It turns out it's not that cool. <laughs> Um, or a mix of the three, or an empty place. And we do that times 20. And this is uh, Noam, who's a graduate student in the lab that did this. Um, and so we just putting that algae under there for seven days. We then remove the algae, we add four corals, and we watch what happens over a period of time. So this is saying, did the algae do it, not something else? Um, and what we get is this for the two different corals that we looked at. Um, and this is the percent mortality um, looking at um, the, the different algal treatments here. And, <clears throat> um, you know, so we get the, the algal treatment effect, and this is a sort of the coral species effect. So if we just look at the different algal treatments, then uh, we get a significant effect of algae with the empty one dying a lot less than everybody else. So everybody else is, is bad off. Um, the empty one is better off, okay? If we clump all that and we look at corals, um, then, you know, the Acropora die more quickly than the Postalopora in this one. So, you know, all algae increase coral mortality. Uh, coral species differed in their susceptibility, not too surprising. Um, what I was a bit surprised about, the, the dictyota, which is where this sort of orange one here, has a lot of terpenes and stuff in it that are kind of toxic. And these others don't, although they have some, some other compounds, but it really just looked like maybe Maybe it's just organics, okay? Maybe there's nothing magic about what's going in there. And so to try to test that, um, I wanted them to use tacos and put out, but in fact, they couldn't find tacos in Morea. So we used rice and did that same experiment. If you just add rice, here's the death rate. And if you don't add it, there's the death rate. So just putting carbohydrates of some sort into the sediments. Uh, makes a big difference. <clears throat> and then, you know, is this just something local or is it a, a larger issue? Um, in other words, is this 
one bay in fringe Polynesia, or might it be something more general with corals? Because coral diseases have been a worldwide deal for the last 30, 40 years. Um, this is that paper I talked about where um, through the years 2011 up to whatever that is, it's so fuzzy, I think 2018, and sort of the sargassum in the Atlantic that's being deposited. So like I was showing you locally in uh, French Polynesia, this is happening sort of Caribbean and, and warm water Atlantic wide. Um, and the hotter this looks, the, the more of it there is. And so this is coral disease in the, in the Caribbean. And this is where you start getting, and so there's bad stuff happening before this, okay? Not saying this is the only thing going on, but this steep drop off here, all of a sudden it starts about 2011, um, is coincident with the big buildup in sargassum happening in the Caribbean and being delivered um, into that area. And so, um, you know, the disease outbreak sort of co-occurred with this increase in sargassum there. Um, here's what I think may be going on is that um, we've had a couple of hundred years of removing the janitors. That didn't necessarily cause something bad to happen quickly, or if it did, we weren't watching because we don't have very good data from 200 years ago. Um, but you know, you were collecting lots of these, you're, you're selling them in the Asian market by the hundreds of millions every year and have been doing that for at least a hundred years. Um, then not only are you not cleaning up, but you've changed the system so that you're growing all this organic mass that's now transportable and you're delivering that to shallow water areas all of a sudden. So you're dumping trash at the same time you remove the janitors. And, um, you know, this may be a, a ecological fuse of a sort that we lit 200 years ago, but that's coming to fruition much more now, both because we remove the janitors, but also because we keep throwing trash out there and our rate of trash production is increasing. Um, and so, you know, are those kind of long ecological fuses? Is this one weird possible example? Or are there a bunch of those, you know, that we ought to be paying more attention to? In other words, is this unique or might it be common? And I would, I would argue, and um, my buddy Jim Estes has argued the same thing that, um, and, and I assume most of you know this story, but I'll, I'll tell it quickly. Um, sea otters were hunted almost to extinction. Um, they weren't eating the, the urchins, etc. There were a few left in Alaska and they started moving those back down to Oregon, Northern California, Washington, et cetera. Once they moved them, those populations started growing and growing and growing. And every year there were just more of them and they were moving further south. And the world was wonderful. We had reintroduced the otters. And then all of a sudden they started disappearing. And people looked at and said, okay, there's a disease. Nope, they seem healthy. Um, you know, what's going on? What's going on? It turned out that killer whales were eating them. And if, if you looked at a thousand miles of Alaskan coastline, it took 3.8 killer whales to eat all of the otters in a thousand miles of Alaskan waters, okay? If they were eating nothing but that, or it took 38 of them eating otters as 10% of their diet. Either way, sea otters are like Hershey's Kisses for killer whales, okay? They're not, it's not a meal. It's just a bowl full of little snacks and you just eat, it's like, what is it? The Pringles where you pull the top off, you know, you're going to eat the whole thing. It's, it's not going to live. Okay. And if you look back in the literature, um, these were called whale killers, not killer whales. And they ate whales. Okay. And there was a lot of argument about this initially. People thought he was nuts. Um, but people now have over and over again, seen these attacking and eating whales. And, um, you know, there's when they're eating the, otters. But what had gone on is in the 
after the Second World War, both the Japanese and the Russians had a lot of leftover ships and they had a lot of men coming home from war without jobs. And they re-outfitted those ships as whaling vessels and employed the men and sent them out to get the whales. And so what happened is, you know, greater whales just crashed. This had been the food of the killer whales. And so then they started eating harbor seals and they crashed. And then they started eating sea lions and they crashed. And then they started. And so this has gone from, you know, steak to corn cobs to Hershey's Kisses. You're working your way down the, the size hierarchy there. And um, there's nothing that proves that all of this was killer whales, but it's all consistent with the story that in the 40s, we lit a fuse that blew up in the, in the late 90s or early 2000s. So 50 or 60 years for that to really happen or for us to see it at least. And that's, that's just, you know, the story and that's this part. And then that totally changed the coastal biology of Alaska and, and other areas, okay. Um, there are probably some other examples of this. Um, these are, you know, oysters. You guys know this story down here, but in Chesapeake Bay, supposedly they filtered the bay about once every three days completely. And now it's less than once a year. Um, and so you got seagrasses sort of turning to phytoplankton and starting anaerobic, uh, you know, or starting low oxygen levels and killing things. Um, again, that the harvesting happened quite some time before the crash. I think the same sort of thing may be going on here. Um, there's examples where people have, um, poisoned off, you use, um, you know, some of these <clears throat> um, compounds that are in, in dead cows, the vultures eat them um, because the vultures aren't eating these guys, they're eaten by wild dogs and, and et cetera. And then the increase in rabies in India when this happened went way up and a lot more humans died of rabies than had been done before. And again, sort of one of these long fuses. Um, so I'm going to argue that the impact of removing, you know, lower trophic levels, the janitors could be common. Looks like it for vultures, um, you know, oysters, uh, these guys. And, you know, they may take longer to be expressed, but they're worrisome. And especially if we add, or, you know, a lot more organics in different combinations, we're adding lots of compounds that we don't know quite what they do. We're adding heat, you know, the whole sort of global thing is changing. And as we're removing the janitors, that makes it particularly difficult to keep things cleaned up. And uh, so I'll take questions, but I, I wanna point out that Cody did a lot of this work and Noma a bit of it. So that's it, thank you. Thanks.